So I have a number of people on Facebook who are friends who are incredibly talented people. And many of them are pastors, not all of them. Uh, this guy is, and he wrote a poem. It's a long poem, a complex poem. It's not a poem that I'm going to read for the sermon because it would take a long time, but I like the way it ended, and so I'm going to read the very last, the last phrase of the poem. And the last phrase starts like this. Keep God weird. We are no longer stressing the little things or afraid of the big things. Like Maya said, all the caged birds sing. Inhale the incense that the wise men bring. Keep God weird. It reminded me in terms of his basic message of a poem by the Sufi poet Hafiz who wrote, Every child has known God. Not the God of names, not the God of don'ts, not the God who never does anything weird, but the God who knows only four words and keeps repeating them, saying, come dance with me. Keep God weird. Our God is the dancing God. Interesting concepts, aren't they? But I think they're ones that say something very important to us, something we need to kind of remember about God. God is a little wild, a little free, a little unpredictable, and perhaps, perhaps, a little, from a human perspective, weird. I have to tell you that I think this is a very important message for us to hear because we want God very, very tame. We want God logical, safe, contained. We want God predictable. And perhaps we even want a God at some level that we can control, and maybe even manipulate. Now, of course, we know it doesn't really work that way, right? Jesus, in his teachings, <clears throat> made it very clear that God is not exactly a domesticated God. If you think about the Sermon on the Mount, right, where the core of Jesus' teachings are found, some of those lessons in that lesson on the Mount are a little bit weird. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the poor. I mean, really? Is that how we think? Think about this te teaching. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be the children of your Father who is in heaven. For God causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And that's the way life is, isn't it? Bad things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people. God is at least a little bit weird. Now, maybe not everybody would put it that way, but I think most of us would agree that God is truly not tame. God does not act according to neat formulas. That's one of the things that we learn in the parables of the seeds. So let's hear the words of Jesus as they come to us from Mark chapter 4. Jesus also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, and night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the sock, then the head, then the full kernel in the head, and as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts a sickle to it, because the harvest has come. And again he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on the earth, and yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all the garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. Now, I happen to like parables. Luke has the most parables. Mark doesn't have very many, but he has this one. The cool thing about parables is their stories, right? They put something visual in front of us, and I'm a visual, so I, that's why I like them. So one of the things that we see here in this story is that the work of God is irresistible. The farmer in the story scatters the seed. Actually, the Greek word implies that this farmer just kind of dumps the seed on the ground. Is that how you do it, Don? Okay. But he... But, it implies that he's a bit careless, right? He just kind of throws it out there, kind of a bad farmer. And then what? 
Well, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, whether he does anything, in other words, the seed sprouts and grows, even though he doesn't know how. This is kind of a clueless farmer, right? Just sits around, lets what happens happen. But the seeds do grow, right? The harvest does come. That's the point of the story. God is amazing at bringing forth the harvest, even when we don't or won't or can't or whatever help. Doesn't mean, by the way, that we get to sit back and let God do it all. The farmer still has to scatter the seed, but God makes it happen, often with little help from us. Bottom line, it's not about us. It's not about us. But this means we have to learn to do something very important. We have to learn how to trust. Because the work of God, as we see in the parable, often unfolds slowly. Barbara Taylor Brown, in a sermon on this parable, points out that we're constantly living between the planting and the harvest. And a lot can happen, right, between the planting and the harvest. There can be droughts. There can be frosts. There can be hail. There can be swarms of locusts. And so as we work with God and as we trust God and as we throw the seeds out there into the soil, we sometimes are left wondering what God is going to do, whether God's going to do anything. And we end up waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for things to play themselves out. But Jesus' message was pretty clear, right? The harvest is coming. Somehow, the sacred is going to make this happen. Something's going to happen. You watch, you wait, you see. That's what the first parable is all about. So the first parable is a parable of trust. It is a parable about faith. God is at work. The harvest is going to come. It's inevitable. That's what we're called to believe. Trusting the soil. Believing that the automatic earth, as Brown calls it, is going to yield its fruit. But if the first parable is about sowing the seed, the second parable is about the seed itself. And of course, this is the mustard seed. When I was a little kid and we graduated, I think it was from the basement of the church into the higher levels of the church in Sunday school, they all gave us, they gave us a little Bible. Anybody get little Bibles when they were in great children? And they were, they, were, they were little teeny Bibles and they had a zipper. And on the end of the zipper fob was a little round glass ball. And guess what was in the ball? A mustard seed. That's right. Anybody else get a mustard seed Bible? I, I think that was a big thing back in the 50s. <laughs> so, so this is about the mustard seed, right? Now, mustard seeds are really small. Now, that was the whole point of the story. The kingdom of God, Jesus says, is like a mustard seed. Well, that's kind of comforting. We often think, when we think of faith, when we think of sacred presence, when we think of God, we think of big a big faith of God's presence being big and unmistakable of the Christian life being about big gestures and big feelings and big impact, right? Big, big. But Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Tiny, tiny, tiny. Weird. What we're told is the kingdom begins and the kingdom persists, perhaps, in smallness. In small steps, in small hopes, in small gestures, and even, it is implied, in small faith. Well, there's bigness there, right? But it comes out of smallness. Out of the small seed comes the big tree. Out of small faith, big things come. It doesn't take much with God. And by the way, it's not unimportant that the tree here that comes forth is a mustard tree, a mustard bush. Mustard plant was not a plant that was desired in any garden or anybody's field, right? You wouldn't plant one. Think of dandelions or morning glory or Canada thistle. 
Canadian thistle. If you're from the south, think of kudzu. The mustard seed is like that. It was an unwanted, uncontrollable, disorderly, disruptive, intrusive plant. In other words, the mustard bush was a weed. So we know what weeds do to gardens, right? They create havoc. They're wild, they're uncontrollable. Give them a little room and boom, suddenly there they are everywhere, right? Dandelions everywhere. Stick tights everywhere. Weeds dominate. Well, the realm of God is like that. That's what I like about that image, right? What God's bring forth is like that. It's a little wild, a little out of control, pretty much irresistible. Give it a little room and boom. You never know what's going to happen. So this parable is about the generosity of God, about what God can do with even small faith, about what God can do with meager resources, specifically about what God can do with us. Speaking of us, the fact that we are a part of this whole thing is also a little bit weird. One of the reasons, that is one of the reasons that the story about Samuel and David is included in the lectionary for today. It's kind of interesting thinking about the thread between the three passages that we were given for this week. But think about the story of the anointing of David, right? Samuel's called to go to Bethlehem. He's called to anoint one of the sons of Jesse to be the king of Israel, to replace Saul. Saul has been killed. So Samuel goes, and seven sons of Jesse are paraded before him, right? Big, tall, mature, warrior-like guys, perfect to be the king, very kingly. And as each one comes before Samuel, Samuel looks at their strength, he looks at their size, and he goes, oh yeah, wow, this has got to be the one. And God says, no, seven times, right? Eliab, Abinadab, Shema, one after another. Nope, 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 nope. And finally, in frustration, Samuel has to say to Jesse, don't you have any more sons? And Samuel goes, well, yeah, we got one. But he's, you know, the youngest, and he's kind of a wimpy little guy. We just left him out with the sheep because we knew he wouldn't be the one. And of course, Samuel says, Bring him in. And when David comes in, God says yes. God takes us for all of our problems, all of our smallness, all of our weakness, all of our failures, all of our unpreparedness, and God says yes. Right? This one. Right here. Right here. Right here. This one. This is the one that I'm saying yes to. And what happens when God says yes? What happens when the seed gets planted? What happens when the seed flourishes? Well, that brings us to our passage from 2 Corinthians. I'm going to get them all in today. Listen to the end of that reading. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Behold, everything has become new. When God says yes, when the seed is planted, when the harvest comes, something happens. But specifically, something happens to us. Something so profound that Paul says we're new creations. We're not remodeled creations. We're not somewhat altered creations. We're not God tinkered with us a little bit creations. We are new creations. Recreated, made new, made different. And in the passage, we are given one terribly important example of what that difference looks like. As recreated humans, we now see no one from a human point of view. We see people from a sacred point of view. You realize how big that is? We don't see people with the same eyes. We see a person and we don't see poor. We don't see addict. We don't see mentally ill. We don't see immigrant. We don't see gay, lesbian, or transgender. We don't see black. We don't see brown. We don't see male. We don't see 
female, we don't see conservative, we don't see liberal, we don't even see Republican or Democrat. We see a child of God. Valuable, precious, loved, accepted. A child of God. And seeing differently, we act differently, hopefully. Most of the time, maybe. But we try to act differently, seeing differently. We act with acceptance and with compassion and with gentleness and with generosity and with love. So what are the take-homes for today out of all of these passages that just somehow were woven together in the lectionary? Well, the first one is that God is not tame. God's not tame, God's not safe, God's not logical, God's not predictable. Second thing we learn is a little bit of God goes a long way. And God takes what is small and makes big things happen. Third thing we learn is that we're part of the story. God looks at us and says, yes. And involves us in the process of making the sacred happen in this world, of bringing the kingdom into being in this world. And when the sacred touches us, we are changed and made into new creations. And one of the ways that that changes us is that we are given new eyes. God is a God to trust. God is a God of the small. God is a God who takes small things and makes big things. God changes the way we see. God changes the way we respond. God blows apart our world and puts them back together in a new way. And we are to watch and to wait and to see and to participate. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your word to us today. We thank you for the words from the Old Testament. We thank you for the words from Paul, but above all, we thank you for those parables from Jesus that remind us about what this is all about. Being made new, seeing in a new way, behaving in a new way, being new people. Help us to live that out day by day by day. This we pray in the name of the Christ. Amen.